The Prophecies and Revelations of St. Bridget of Sweden It seemed to me that I saw some people standing around getting ropes ready, while some were standing and getting horses ready, and others were busy forging tongs or constructing a gallows. While I was looking at all this, a maiden appeared who seemed to be troubled. She asked if I understood it all. When I answered that I did not understand, she said, All this that you see is the spiritual punishment being prepared for the soul of that man whom you know. The ropes are for tying to the horse that will drag his soul. The tongs are for tearing his nose, eyes, ears, and lips off. The gallows is for hanging him. Since I was upset over this, the maiden told me, Do not be upset. There is still time. If he wants, he will be able to break the ropes, knock down the horses, melt the tongs like wax, and remove the gallows. Moreover, he can obtain such an ardent love of God that these symbols of punishments will become for him the highest marks of honor, so much so that the ropes that were to bind him in contempt will be turned into belts of gold for him. Instead of the horses that were to drag him across the plains, angels will be sent to escort him into the presence of God. Instead of the tongs with which he was to be terribly mutilated, his nostrils will be filled with a fine fragrance, and his mouth with a fine taste, his eyes with the loveliest of sights, his ears with the most delightful of melodies. Explanation This man was a marshal of the king. He came to Rome with so much humility and contrition that he would frequently go around the stations with bared head, praying to God and getting others to pray that he would not return to his country if that meant a relapse into his former sins. God heard his petition. When he left Rome and came to Montefiascone, he fell ill and died there. Another revelation also concerns him. Daughter, see what God's mercy accomplishes, what a good intention accomplishes. This soul was in the jaws of the lion, but his good intention snatched him away from the lion's teeth, and he is now on the way to the homeland, and he will partake of all the goods that occur in the church of God. O oh, sweet Jesus, creator of all that has been created, would that these people knew and understood the warmth of your Holy Spirit. Then they would long more for heaven and abhor the things of the earth. An answer immediately came to me in spirit, saying, Their excesses and superfluity are an obstacle to the visitations of the Holy Spirit. You see, excesses in food and drink and in banqueting with friends prevent both the Holy Spirit from becoming sweet to them, and their having had enough of worldly pleasure. Excess of gold and silver, equipment, clothing, and income prevent the spirit of my love from inflaming and kindling their hearts. Excess of servants and horses and animals are an obstacle to the approach of the Holy Spirit. No, indeed, they withdraw themselves from their servants, my angels, while their betrayers, the devils, draw near to them. They are therefore ignorant of the sweetness and the visitation by which I, who am God, visit holy souls and my friends. Hear now what my enemies do as opposed to what my friends once did. My friends used to enter monasteries out of wise fear and divine charity. But those who are now in the monasteries go off into the world out of pride and cupidity, following their selfish will and living for the pleasures of their body. The judgment for those who die with such a disposition is that they shall neither experience nor obtain heavenly joy but only endless punishment in hell. Know that those who live in a cloister but are forced by divine charity and against their own will to become superiors shall not be counted in that number. Knights, moreover, who used to bear arms, were prepared to give their lives for justice and to shed their blood for the sake of the holy faith by helping the needy to obtain justice and by restraining evildoers and keeping them humble. Yet now hear how far they have turned away. Nowadays they prefer to die in war for the sake of pride and cupidity and envy on the promptings of the devil rather than to live according to my commands in order to obtain everlasting joy. Therefore, the wages of a just condemnation shall be given to all those who die with such a disposition. This means that devils will be given to their souls to be eternally joined with them as their wages. However, those who do serve me are to receive their soldiers' wages together with the heavenly army forever without end. The son speaks, Daughter, how stands the world now? She answers, like an open sack to which everyone runs, like a man running without caring what he is following. The Lord answers, Therefore, I am right to go with my plow over the earth, plowing over Gentiles and Christians, sparing neither old nor young, either poor nor rich. Each shall be judged according to his or her own righteousness, 
and each shall die in his or her own sin, and their homes shall be left without inhabitants. However, I shall not do this until the consummation. She replied, O Lord, do not get angry if I speak. Send some of your friends to warn and admonish them about their danger. And the Lord said, It is written that when the rich man despaired of his own salvation in hell, he asked that someone might be sent to warn his brothers so that they would not perish in the same way. The answer to him was, That shall in no way be done, for they have Moses and the prophets to teach them. So I tell you now, they have the gospels and the sayings of the prophets, they have the words and examples of the holy doctors, they have reason and intelligence. Let them make use of these things, and they will be saved. If I send you, you would not be able to cry out loud enough to be heard. If I send my friends, there are but few of them, and if they cry out, they will scarcely be heard. However, I will send my friends to those I choose, and they shall prepare the way for God. The sun speaks, Why do happy dreams lift you up so much? And why do sad dreams depress you so? Did I not tell you that the devil is envious and can accomplish no more without God's permission than a piece of straw beneath your feet? I also told you that he is the father, an inventor of lies and that he mixes some truth in with all his falsehoods. I tell you, accordingly, that the devil never sleeps but goes around looking for an occasion to ensnare you. You must therefore be careful so that the devil does not deceive you, using his subtle knowledge to discover your inner states by means of your outer movements. Sometimes he induces happy moods into your heart to make you feel empty joy. At other times he gives you sad ones to make you omit in your sorrow the good deeds that you could do and to make you sad and wretched before anything sad has occurred. Sometimes the devil also puts a great many falsehoods into the kind of deluded heart that desires worldly esteem and so deceives many people, such as false prophets. This happens to people who love other things more than God. This is why it happens that a lot of truth is found in the midst of a great many false words. For the devil could never deceive anyone if he did not mix some truth in with the falsehood, as was clear in the case of the man you saw in a seizure. Although he was confessing that there is one God, his indecent gestures and strange words showed that the devil was possessing him and dwelling in him. Now, however, you might ask, why do I permit the devil to lie? I answer, I have permitted and do permit this due to the sins of the people and of the priests who have wanted to know things that God did not want them to know, who desired success in areas where God saw that it was not beneficial to their salvation. Thus, it is because of sins that God permits many things to occur that would not occur if humankind had not abused grace and reason. Those prophets who longed for nothing but God and did not wish to speak God's words except for God's sake, these did not fall victims to deception but spoke and loved the words of truth. Yet, as not all dreams should be welcomed, so not all dreams should be rejected, since God sometimes reveals good things in dreams, including the hour of their death to bad people in order that they might repent of their sins. Sometimes he also reveals good things to good people in order that they might make greater progress toward God. So, whenever and as often as such things occur to you, do not lay them to heart but ponder them and study them with your wise spiritual friends, or else dismiss them and shut them out of your heart as if you had not seen them because people who delight in such things are very often fooled and become disturbed. So, be firm in your faith in the Holy Trinity, love God with your whole heart, be obedient in failure as well as in success, do not think yourself better than anyone but tremble even when you do good, do not trust your own sense more than others but entrust your entire will to God, ready to do everything God wants. Then you will not need to be afraid of dreams. If they are happy dreams, do not trust or desire them without considering God's glory in them. If they are sad, do not be saddened but place yourself entirely in God's hands. The mother says then, I am the mother of mercy. I get the clothes ready for my daughter while she sleeps. I get food ready for my daughter while she gets dressed. I get a crown and every good reward ready for my daughter while she is working. The mother speaks to her son Jesus, saying, our daughter is like a lamb that puts its head in the lion's mouth. The son answers her, It is better for the lamb to put its head in the lion's mouth and become one flesh and one blood with the lion than that the lamb should suck blood from the lion's flesh and make the lion angry and then the lamb, whose food is hay, would get sick. Yet, my dear mother, since you bore all wisdom and the fullness of all intelligence in your womb, 
Get her to understand the meaning of the lion and of the lamb. The mother answers, Blessed are you, my son, who, while remaining eternally with the father, came down to me, yet never separating yourself from the father. It is you who are the lion of Judah's tribe. You are the lamb without stain whom John pointed out with his finger. A person puts her head into the lion's mouth when she entrusts her whole will to God and has no intention of carrying out her own will, even if she is able, unless she knows that it is pleasing to you. A person sucks the lion's blood when she becomes impatient with the plan of your justice, wishing and striving to obtain other things than those that you have decided for her, or when she wants to live in a state of life other than that the one that is pleasing to you and beneficial for herself. God is not pleased with such desires but rather provoked to anger. Just as the lamb feeds on hay, so too a person should be satisfied with humble conditions and a lowly state in life. It is because of human ingratitude and impatience that God allows many things to occur for the salvation of humankind that would not happen if people were more patient. Therefore, my daughter, give your will to God. If sometimes you feel less patient, begin all over again through penance. For penance works like a good washerwoman does on stains, and contrition is like a good bleacher. The son speaks, Do not be afraid, daughter. This sick woman will not die, for her works are pleasing to me. When the woman did die, the son said again, Do you see, daughter? What I told you was true. The woman is not dead, for her glory is great. The separation of body and soul is for the righteous no more than a dream, for they wake up to life eternal. That which should be called death is when the soul lives separated from the body in an eternal death. There are many people who, while not mindful of the life to come, do wish to die a Christian death. Now, what does a Christian death mean, if not to die as I died, innocently, willingly, and patiently? Am I then contemptible because my death was contemptible and harsh? Or are my chosen ones foolish, because they had to bear contemptible sufferings? Or was this the will of fortune, or did the movement of the stars cause it? Of course not. I and my chosen ones did indeed suffer harshly, but in order to show by word and example that the way to heaven is difficult, and in order to make people realize fully how necessary purification is for the wicked, seeing that the innocent elect suffered so greatly. Know, then, that a person dies a contemptible and evil death when he dies while living a dissolute life and with the intention of sinning, when he has worldly success and desires to live for a long time but does not remember to give thanks to God. A person lives and dies happily who loves God with his whole heart, though he may be struck down by a despicable death or afflicted by a chronic illness, because his harsh death lessens his sins as well as the punishment for sin and increases his reward. Look, I will remind you of two men, both of whom died a despicable and bitter death according to human opinion. Yet, if they had not received such a death through my great mercy, they would not have been saved. However, because the Lord does not twice smite the contrite of heart, both of them attain their crown. This is why the friends of God should not be saddened if they suffer violent temporal pain or die a bitter death. It is a blessed thing to weep for a time and to be troubled in this world so as not to come to the heaviest purgatory, where there will be no escape and no more time for working. The mother speaks, Go to him who has the faculty of absolution. No matter how leprous the doorkeeper is, he can still open the door as well as a healthy man, provided he has the keys. It is the same with absolution and the sacrament of the altar. No matter who the minister is, provided he has a lawful faculty of absolution, he can absolve from sins. Therefore, no priest is to be rejected. However, I would forewarn you about two things. The first is that he will not get what he so longs for in the flesh. The other is that his life will soon be cut short. Just as an ant that carries its load of grain day and night sometimes falls down and dies right when it gets close to the nest, and the grain remains outside it, so, right when this man has begun to reach the goal of his efforts, he will die and be punished, and his empty efforts will come to naught. The mother speaks, God's friends are said to be like two door posts through which others can enter. Therefore, one must guard carefully against anything rough or hard or any other kind of obstacle getting in the way of those going in. These door posts symbolize nothing other than the moral composure and righteous works and edifying words that should be found every day in the lives of God's friends.
one must therefore guard attentively against anything hard, that is, disparaging or coarse speech, being found in the mouths of God's friends, or any worldly tendencies noticeable in their actions that may cause those seeking entrance to run away and shudder to enter there. The mother speaks, They are like a worm that sees excellent seed but does not care how much fruit is lost or falls off, so long as it can tear away at the roots or the parts closest to the ground. In the same way, these men do not care that souls are being lost, so long as they can get their profits and earthly possessions. The justice of my son will therefore come upon them, and they shall soon be taken away. She replies, All the time that for us seems long is no more than the least grain of the balance before God. Your son's patience with evildoers is great indeed. The mother replies, I tell you truly, their judgment shall not be delayed but shall come to them with horror and they shall be dragged away from pleasure into shame. The son speaks, Listen, you who long for the harbor after the storms of this world. Whoever is at sea has nothing to fear so long as that person stays there with him who can stop the winds from blowing, who can order any bodily harm to go away and the rocky crags to soften, who can command the storm winds to lead the ship to a restful harbor. So it is in the physical world. There are those who lead the body like a ship across the waters of the world, bringing some people consolation but others distress, for human free will lead some souls to heaven, others to the depths of hell. The human will is pleasing to God when it desires to hear nothing more fervently than God's praise nor to live for anything other than God's service, for God dwells happily in such a will and lightens every danger and smooths away all the crags by which the soul is often endangered. What do these rocky crags represent if not evil desire? It is delightful to see and own worldly possessions, to rejoice in the elegance of one's body and to taste whatever delights the flesh. Such things often endanger the soul. But when God is on board the ship, all these things grow weak, and the soul scorns them all, for all bodily and earthly beauty is like a glass that is painted on the outside but full of earth on the inside. When the glass gets broken, it is no more useful than the dark soil of the earth, which has been created for no other purpose than to be used, if one owns any, in order to gain heaven. All those people who no more desire to hear of their own or the world's esteem than they do the noxious air, those who mortify every limb of their body and hate the abominable lust of their flesh, all these can rest here in quiet and wake up with joy, because God is with them at all times. I make my complaint, not only on my own behalf but also on behalf of many of God's elect, before your majesty, concerning the plight of four sisters, daughters of a mighty king, each of whom held position and power within her inherited estate. All those who wished to look on the beauty of these sisters received solace from their beauty and good example from their piety. The first sister was called humility in managing every deed to be done. The second sister was called abstinence from all sinful intercourse. The third sister was called contentment without any excess. The fourth sister was called charity regarding the affliction of one's neighbors. These four sisters are now regarded as worthless on their own inherited estate and scorned by almost everyone. In their place for other, illegitimate sisters have been installed. Though they are the offspring of a fornicator, they are now called noble women. The first of these is Lady Pride, who lives to please the world. The second is called Lady Desire, who follows the body's every appetite. The third is called Lady Excess beyond the limits of necessity. The fourth is called Lady Simony, against whose deception almost nobody can protect himself, since, whether things are rightly or wrongly acquired, she greedily takes it all in. These four ladies contradict the precepts of God, wishing to render them worthless, and they are an occasion of eternal damnation to many souls. Therefore, Act in accordance with the love that God has shown you, and swiftly help to raise up the four sisters called virtues, which proceed from the very virtue of Jesus Christ the High King, and which have now been laid low in the Holy Church, the inherited estate of Christ. Lay low instead the vices that are called ladies in this world, the traitors of souls, born of that traitor the devil, vice itself. Sir, I warn you about the danger your soul is in and remind you that we read about a certain king in the Old Testament who felt a desire for another man's vineyard and offered him the full price for it. However, since the owner did not want to sell it, the king was angered and unjustly expropriated it for himself with violence. 
the Holy Spirit spoke to him a little later through the mouth of a prophet, sentencing the king and queen to die a wretched death for their injustice. The prophecy was fulfilled in them, and their children had not the least benefit of the possession of that vineyard. Now then, since you are Christian and keep the whole faith and know with certainty that God is the same now in his power and justice as he was then, you ought to know, accordingly, that, if you have a desire to possess something unjustly, either by forcing the owner to sell it against his will or by not making a fair offer, that same powerful and just judge will be the avenger. You, moreover, should fear for such a sentence overtaking you as is said to have befallen that queen. You should sorrow that your children will not be made rich by your ill-gotten goods, but will rather suffer the distress of poverty. By the passion of Jesus Christ, who redeemed your soul with his precious blood, I exhort and admonish you not to destroy your soul for the sake of fleeting possessions, but to make full restitution to all those who have suffered loss at your hands or because of you. Restore whatever you have wrongly acquired both to relieve those who now suffer sorrow and as an example for others, if you want to gain the friendship of God. God is my witness that I do not write you this on my own, for I do not know you, but because something happened to a person that compelled me to write out of holy compassion for your soul. For that person, not asleep but awake in prayer, heard the voice of an angel saying, BJRN, BJRN, how overbold you are toward God and toward justice. Your willpower has so overcome the conscience within you that your conscience is completely silent, while your will speaks and acts. That is why you shall soon come to judgment in the divine court. Your will shall then be silent, and your conscience shall speak and condemn you in accordance with right justice. The sun speaks. If the enemy is battering at the city gates, you should not be like goats that run toward the wall, or like rams that rear themselves up on their hind legs and butt against each other with their horns. Instead you should be like chickens that see a bird of prey in the sky aiming to harm them, and take refuge beneath the wings of their mother, and hide there. They are happy even if they only get hold of a single one of the mother's feathers and take cover there. Who is your enemy if not the devil, who looks maliciously upon every good deed and is wont to batter and agitate the human mind with temptations? Sometimes he batters it with anger and slander sometimes with impatience and criticism toward God's decisions whenever things do not turn out as one wishes. Very often he batters and upsets you with innumerable thoughts in order to draw you away from God's service and cast a shadow over your good works before God. Therefore, no matter what temptations you have, you should not abandon your position nor be like the goats that run up toward the wall, that is, to be hard of heart, or to criticize other people's actions in your hearts since a person who is bad today is often good tomorrow. Rather, you should lower your horns, stand still, and listen, that is, humble yourselves and be fearful, patiently entreating God so that bad beginnings may be changed into a happy ending. Nor should you be like the rams brandishing their horns, that is, paying back insult with insult and adding taunt to taunt. Rather, you should stand steadily on your feet and remain silent, that is, check your passions, so that in your speech and responses you may show forethought and patient forcefulness, because the righteous man overcomes himself and restrains himself even from licit remarks in order to avoid loquacity and offensiveness. When a person is agitated in mind and lets go of everything he feels inside, he seems somehow to have vindicated himself and revealed the instability of his mind. This is the reason why he will be left without a reward, because he was unwilling to be patient for a time. Had he been patient, he would both have won over his offending brother and fitted himself for a greater reward. What do the hen's wings represent if not divine power and wisdom? You see, I am like a hen that powerfully protects from the snares of the devil those chickens that run to me when I call, that is, those who desire the shade of my wings, and I summon them to salvation through my wise inspirations. What does the feather represent if not my mercy? One who obtains my mercy can feel as secure as a chicken sheltered beneath its mother's wings. So, be like the chickens running toward my will. In all temptations and adversities say both out loud and in your deeds, May God's will be done. For I protect those who trust in me with my power. I refresh them with my mercy. I hold them with my patience. I visit them with my solace. I enlighten them with my wisdom. I reward them a hundredfold with my love. The son speaks, If this man wishes to honor me, let him first work to reduce my dishonor 
and increase my honor. My dishonor consists in the contempt shown for the commandments that I have commanded and the words that I have personally spoken, which are completely disregarded by almost everyone. If he wishes to love me, then let him from now on show greater charity toward all souls for whom I opened up heaven with my heart's blood. If he longs to rest with God more than to enlarge his inheritance, then he will surely find greater desire as well as help from God in order to win back that place, Jerusalem, where my dead body lay. Tell him, you who are hearing this, I, God, allowed him to be crowned king. This is why it is especially his duty to follow my will and to love and honor me above all things. If he fails to do so, his days will be cut short. Moreover, those people who are emotionally attached to him will be painfully separated from him, and his kingdom will be divided into several parts. It seemed to a certain person that she was in a large chancel, and a great, shining sun appeared. There were two pulpits, as it were, in the chancel, one to the right and the other to the left, with a long space intervening between them and the sun. Two rays of the sun fell upon the pulpits. Then a voice was heard from the pulpit on the left side, saying, Hail, Eternal King, Creator and Redeemer, and Just Judge. Behold, your vicar, who is seated on your chair in the world, has now brought his chair back to its ancient and earlier place, where sat the first Pope, Peter, Prince of the Apostles. A voice from the pulpit on the right replied, saying, How can he enter into the holy church when the barrels of the door hinges are full of rust and dirt? This is why the doors are inclining toward the ground, because there is no room in the barrels to receive the hinge pins that should be supporting the doors. The pins have been completely bent outward and are not at all curved in such a way as to hold the doors in place. The floor is all dug up and has been converted into pits as deep as bottomless wells. The ceiling is smeared with pitch and burning with sulfurous flames, dripping down like dense rain. Thick, black fumes arising from the pits and the dripping of the ceiling have stained all the walls and made their color as ugly to look at as gory blood and pus. It is therefore not fitting for God's friend to have his dwelling in such a temple. The voice from the left replied, saying, Give a spiritual explanation of what you have described physically. The other voice then said, The Pope is symbolized and represented by the doors. The barrels of the door hinges signify humility. This should be empty of all pride so that nothing is to be seen there except what pertains to the humble office of pontiff, just as the barrels should be completely empty of any rust. However, the barrels, that is, the insignia of humility, are now so full of excess and wealth and resources kept for no other purpose than pride that nothing seems humble, since all his humility has been converted into worldly pomp. Therefore, it is not surprising that the Pope, represented by the doors, is inclining toward worldliness, as symbolized by the rust and the dirt. Accordingly, let the Pope begin with true humility in himself, first of all, in his trappings his clothes, his gold, silver, and vessels of silver, his horses and other equipment getting rid of everything but what is necessary, and donating the rest to the poor and especially, to those whom he knows to be friends of God. Let him then organize his entourage with moderation, and keep only those servants needed to protect him. Although it is in God's hands to call him to judgment, still it is only right for him to have servants both in order to strengthen the cause of justice, and so that he can humble those who rebel against God and against the holy customs of the church. The hinge pins attached to the doors represent the cardinals who have been bent outward and stretched as far as possible toward all pride, greed, and physical pleasure. This is why the Pope should take a hammer and tongs in hand and bend the hinges to his will by not letting them have more clothes, servants, and equipment than necessity and utility require. Let him bend them with the tongs, that is, with his soothing words and divine counsel and fatherly love. Then, if they refuse to obey, he should take the hammer and display severity toward them, doing with them whatever lies in his power and does not go against justice, until they are bent to his will. The floor represents the bishops and the secular clergy, whose greed is bottomless. From their pride and luxurious way of living come the fumes that make all the angels in heaven and all God's friends on earth shun them. The Pope can improve the situation greatly by allowing them to have only what they need and nothing superfluous, and he should order each bishop to watch over the ways of his own clergy. Anyone who refuses to mend his ways and live continently should be stripped of his prebends, 
because God would rather not have a mass said in a given place than let a whorish hand touch the body of God. It seemed to me as though a king was seated on a judgment seat, and each living person stood before him. Each person had two beings standing next to him, one of whom appeared like an armed soldier, the other like a black Ethiopian. A pulpit stood before the judgment seat. On it lay a book, arranged in the same way as I saw earlier when I saw three kings standing before him. It seemed to me that the whole world was standing before the pulpit. Then I heard the judge saying to the armed soldier, Call those whom you have served with love. Those who were named fell down immediately. Some of them lay there for a longer while, others for a shorter, before their souls were separated from the body. I am unable to grasp everything I heard and saw then, for I heard the sentences of many people still living but who will soon be called. However, the following was said to me by the judge, if people would rectify their sins, I will lighten their sentence. Then I saw many people being sentenced, some to purgatory, others to everlasting woe. It seemed that I saw a soul being led to the judge by the soldier and the Ethiopian whom I had seen earlier. It was said to me, What you now see all took place in regard to that soul when she was released from the body. Once the soul had been escorted into the presence of the judge, she stood there alone, no longer in the hands of either of her escorts. She stood there naked and sorrowful, not knowing to what place she would come. It seemed to me then that every word in the book gave its own answer to each and everything the soul was saying. In the hearing of the judge and of the entire host, the armed soldier spoke first, saying, It is not right to bring up as a reproach against this soul the sins for which she has made reparation in confession. I beheld all this but realized then quite well that the soldier who was speaking already had knowledge of everything in God but spoke so that I would understand. A reply then came from the Book of Justice. Although this soul did perform penance, it was not accompanied by a contrition or true satisfaction proportionate to her great sins. She should therefore suffer now for those sins for which she did not make reparation when she was able. When this was said, the soul began to weep so violently that it was as though she had broken down completely. And yet, though her tears could be seen, not a sound could be heard. Then the king said to the soul, let your conscience now declare those sins that were not accompanied by a proportionate satisfaction. Then the soul raised her voice with such force that it was as though it could be heard throughout the whole world. She said, Woe is me that I did not act according to God's commands, which I heard and knew. Then she added in self-accusation, I did not fear God's judgment. The book replied to her, You must therefore now fear the devil. Right away the soul began to fear and tremble as if she were melting away completely, and she said, I had almost no love for God, that is why I did so little good. An immediate reply was made to her from the book, that is why it is just for you to approach closer to the devil than to God, because the devil lured and enticed you to himself with his temptations. The soul replied, I understand now that everything I did was done on the promptings of the devil. A reply was made from the book, Justice dictates that it is the devil's right to repay your accomplishments with pain and punishment. The soul said from head to heel there was nothing I did not dress with pride. Some of my vain and proud manners I invented myself, others I just followed according to the custom of my native land. I washed my hands and face not only in order to be clean but also to be called beautiful by men. A reply was made from the book, Justice says that it is the devil's right to repay you for what you have earned since you dressed and adorned yourself as he inspired and told you to do. The soul said again, My mouth was often open for body talk, because I wanted to please others, and my heart longed for all those things provided it did not result in worldly disgrace or disapproval. A reply was made from the book, That is why your tongue must be drawn out and stretched and your teeth bent in. And all the things you most detest will be set before you, and all the things you like will be taken away from you. The soul said, I enjoyed it immensely when many people took after my example and noticed what I did and copied my manners. A reply was made from the book, Hence, it is just that everyone caught in the sin for which you are about to be punished should also suffer the same punishment and be brought to you. Then your pain will be increased each time someone comes who copied your fashions. After these words, it seemed to me as though a chain was wound about her head like a crown and then tightened so hard that the front and back of her head were joined together. 
Her eyes fell out of their sockets and dangled by their roots at her cheeks. Her hair looked like it had been scorched by flames, and her brains were shattered and flowed out through her nostrils and ears. Her tongue was stretched out and her teeth pressed in. Her arms were twisted like ropes and their bones broke. Her hands, with their skin peeled off, were fastened to her throat. Her breast and belly were bound so hard with her back that her ribs were broken and her heart spilled out together with all her entrails. Her thighs dangled at her flanks, and their broken bones were being pulled out just like a thin thread is used to thread a needle. After this sight, the Ethiopian replied, O oh judge, the soul's sins have now been punished according to justice. Now join the two of us, this soul and me, so that we may never be separated. But the armed soldier replied, Here, judge you who know all things. It concerns you now to hear the last thought and feeling that this soul had at the end of her life. At the very last moment she had the following thought, Oh, if God would only give me enough life, I would gladly make reparation for my sins and serve him all the rest of my lifetime and never more offend him. O oh, judge, such were her last thoughts and wishes. Remember, Lord, that this person did not live long enough to acquire a fully understanding conscience. Therefore, Lord, think of her youth and treat her mercifully. A reply was then made from the Book of Justice, Last thoughts such as these do not deserve hell. Then the judge said, Because of my passion, let heaven be opened up for this soul once she has undergone purgation for her sins for as much time as she is bound to suffer unless she receives assistance from the good works of others still alive. Explanation This woman made a vow of virginity in the presence of a priest, and then married later on. She died giving birth. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now, and at the hour of death. Amen.